Hello and welcome to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viber Goalkeeping. Today's guest has made over 600 league appearances and scored over 140 goals whilst playing for the likes of Bradford City, Bristol City and Blackburn Rovers. Welcome to the show, current Harrogate striker, John Stead. How are you, mate? You all right? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, very well. Good. Got to start off where we, uh, that current things, I suppose. We've got to start off with current stuff. Harrogate, it's been some ride, uh, but how was winning at Wembley in front of zero fans? Uh, strange. It was my first trip to Wembley in my career, so it was a, a sort of a strange uh, scenario, really, and, and surroundings. I don't think not having any fans, as, as a group of players, the you know the experience and, and winning the game and getting our ultimate goal and getting over that line and getting promotion was 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 amazing and you know nothing can take that away away from us as a group and as a, as a club so i think the the only downside is is for the fans you know it's the fans that missed out massively uh, we still got to get there and, and play the game and and enjoy all the celebrations but um you know for the lifelong fans that, that would have given anything to be there that's the disappointing thing uh, and hopefully when things are back to normal we might get another chance to get there I was going to say, is that the aim? Is it just like to go back again so we can have them this time go up the league one? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've, I mean, we're still in the trophy from from last season. We've got a semi final uh, yeah. a week on Thursday, uh, actually against Knox County. And if we beat them, then we we do have another trip, and it's it's penciled in for one of the pilot games, you know, for the fans. So, yeah. th- so there is there is a, a still a glimmer of hope for that this season. Um, but if not, we'll have to do it. Um, Come the end of the season, if if, if it's not automatic, <laughs> I think it's a Sunderland fan. We go the opposite way. We kind of hope that we never have to go to Wembley at any point ever because we hate the place. <laughs> seven times, seven defeats. But um, I think I was I've just been over to Berlin, funnily enough, and I was reading through four four two, and there's a, a good some good stuff on obviously Simon Weaver, and I'm I'm friends with Paul Thurwell, uh, have been for yeah. a while, great guy, but obviously really really highly rated, and the job that they've done as a team can't be underestimated. Um, but how much credit do those two deserve for for getting you into League One, uh, League Two? Yeah, the massive amount. And I, and I think because, you know, from the outside, people just look and think, you know, of the, the gaffers, the chairman's son, and, you know, and, and that can quickly, just from narrow-minded people, can take away from what is actually done in, in that position. He came into the job before, um, before his dad was even involved, you know, before his chairman. So he's been, he's been, plugging away for 10 years now with the football club and and really grown it and moved things forward. And then since they turned full-time professional in 2017, they've just gone from strength to strength. And I think, it, like you say, him and Thirst deserve a huge amount of credit for that because they've grown a club from from nothing and brought it into the football league for the first time in the history is is a huge, huge achievement um, for, for a young management and uh, coaching staff. And, and they, they work fantastically well as a team and the lads love every day in training and we're taking that into games and there's a real good a good feeling about the place as you'd imagine but that's 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 been building uh, and we hope to continue that yeah absolutely um i've got to ask as a Sunderland fan i am biased but you came up against Sunderland only a few weeks back i would imagine you up against big bailey right and obviously he's, he's well liked as Sunderland, even though he's only played five games but um what was it like go against sort of Sunderland as a team and also uh, Bailey Wright as an individual. Yeah, well, it was as, as a team, it was a, a real test for us. Um, you know, obviously a, a squad that's that's football league, you know, through and through and, and played at higher levels and, you know, a, a huge, vast amount of quality in the team. So for us to put ourselves against that was really good. And it was a good test for us. Um, I think for, for large parts of it, we, we dealt with it very well as, as a club and we, and we tried to put our stamp on it and try and get the ball moving like we like to. Um, and then we, we get hit with a bit of a sucker and, and we ended up losing the game. But, you know, it, it was a good test, like I say, and one that we all enjoyed. For me personally, um, yeah, it's always nice, to, you know, to go back and to the magical stadium that that is, you know. With, it's, it was very strange seeing it empty because every time I've been in, in it previously, there's 40,000 there. So it was yeah. it was, it was a strange uh, a strange environment. We we didn't use the well. Half of us used the away change rooms, and half used like a little media bar area. So, obviously, with all the COVID rules, it was it was slightly uh, slightly strange. But um, as a back three, obviously, better rights, you know, solid solid. Deal. I think as a, as a club, I think they're going to do well this season. I, I'm I'm really uh, confident seeing seeing what we saw. Um, you know, it's just getting getting those chances over the line and, and getting the goals in it. I think that's. 
that's been an issue. Certainly an issue while I was there, while I was there. And uh, I think no yeah, comment. There's, there's been, if, if I look down the line since I was there, it's been it's been an issue for a lot of strikers that have, that have been up there, and I think that's um, that's struggling to to follow uh, follow suit from what what was there previously. Um, obviously, with uh, Quinn and Phillips and those kind of players, are very very difficult to follow, and I think a lot of tried and failed. <laughs> With uh, goal scoring, there's one man that you'll know an awful lot about that we're hoping is going to be a player that you know, plays a huge part for Sunderland this year. And you, you spent a season with him, uh, obviously Jack Diamond. I think he's, his stature's grew an awful lot because of the season that he had, but you've played alongside him for a season. As a player and as a person, how excited are you by him and his progression and how far do you think he can go? Uh, it's a tough one that because I don't want to I don't want to jam up too much because I don't mind having him back um, this season. But uh, yeah, a fantastic talent, and I think the the difference that, that I've seen in him since his first sort of month with us, compared to looking through towards the the final the final months of the season and then the playoffs and the final, um, come on leaps and bounds. You know, really growing in stature, looking stronger. Um, he looks like he's filled out a bit. He's more powerful. Um, and and he's he's a he's a player that can carry the ball, and I think that's a, a massive thing these days. If you've got a player that you can rely on to carry the ball up the pitch, you know, on numerous occasions, whether you're under pressure or not, it just it bring, brings the whole team up, gets everybody out, um, and you know he's going to be a threat. So I'm expecting big things from him. To be honest, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it'll fit in with him with with playing the wing backs and stuff. I, I don't mm-hmm. know where he'll fit in with that. I think he is an out and out winger, so I'm, I'm, it'd be interesting to see uh, how he slots into the way. Um, obviously, that you're going to play and and whether that'll affect the amount of games he'll get. I, d- I don't know. Um, it'll be interesting to see. But um, if he if he wants any games at all, we're, 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 we'll be there in open arms waiting for him. <laughs> you see, yeah, I was going to say a lot of Harrogate fans were saying. Uh, I was reading on Twitter, a few of them were saying, oh, it's rubbish, you don't want him, you don't want him back. Uh, we'll take him for a season. So I figured that's a good sign. I figured it's a good yeah. sign. Um, now, once upon a time, obviously, uh, Jack Diamond's the, the current young starlet, but once upon a time, when I was younger, you were as well, um, when you were at Huddersfield. Now, it feels like only last year, it feels like yesterday, but um, you're a Huddersfield boy. You came up through your academy, made your debut at 1819, I think. Um, so what was life growing up in the Huddersfield Academy? Um, it was good. It was very different to the the academies that that are around now and, and the system. It was at first it was a centre of excellence, which is just kind of schoolboy stuff. And um, then as as we progressed into academy, when I left school, um, we, we didn't have a, an under seventeen side, so it was quite difficult for you know leaving school at sixteen and then being pushed into a, a group of players that were predominantly just an under 19s team really and trying to shoehorn your way into into playing regular football was tough for the for the first couple of years of my of my youth system it, it, it was difficult uh, I, I did actually end up playing left wing back for the first couple of years because I, um, we were short of left footers and, and and mine was decent and I could get up and down um, so that's kind of where I started my um, youth team career was left wing back which is a strange one uh, the final season when I got sort of uh, you know turning eighteen, I went up front and and started banging in goals. So so that transition from from playing out of position and not playing a massive amount in the first two years of my my, my youth system, the third year academy just you know propelled me to the reserves. I think I played two or three reserves games and, and from that jumped straight into the first team. But I think that was there wasn't any option for that because the club was going through quite a turmoil time and there was mm. administrations and. We we were forced into using um, the youth team system and, and using players that were homegrown that that didn't cost anything. You know that that was that's what it was, and we were lucky enough to have a good year. I think my year especially had a, a good pool of talent. We had seven or eight players that went through and played in the first team. Uh, some are still playing now um, and had good careers. So we it was fortunate, and um, yeah, it, it, it created a pathway for me to jump straight into the into the first team, which. Nowadays is extremely difficult at any club. Yeah, I was going to say with the, the salary caps that have came in place, um, a few people have touched on how that will actually probably benefit sort of youth team players. People will actually get a chance, and I think we thought that was going to happen at Sunderland, and it sort of did with Lyndon Gooch, Honeyman, and stuff like that. But we've seen the likes of Dan Neal came through, had a great game. He played against uh, Jack Diamonds, one that we've already touched on. Um, if there's a positive to the salary cap, do you think 
youngsters getting game time, much like you did as a kid, because of constraints, is the positive? Yeah, well, I hope so. I, I hope that's that's the way it'll go. I think <clears> as as players in general, we were disappointed that that, that came in. Obviously, as um, as a group of players in the PFA and a union, as, as a whole, you'd, you'd rather not have that cap, obviously, because you're looking after yourselves and your fellow teammates. But I think in the, the grander scheme of things, and I think for me as an older player looking at it as well towards the end of my career, I think it, it will benefit, like you say, the younger players that can come through. And what it also does is as well, it, it gets rid of players out of the league that are just playing for the money. So, so if you see a lot of players that are turning down League One, League Two contracts and going playing non-leagues, they're not doing that to further their career. They're, yeah, they might be at a later stage of the career where it's financial the, the rewards financially out, outgrow where you are in your development stage but at least it like I say it gets rid of players like that and, and you get um, you get hungry young players that want to start climbing the ladder and, and, and play for the reasons that you know I started playing for um, years and years ago yeah because it certainly has changed um, just, I think I was talking to Matt Piper who he has played with um, yeah. you at Sunderland. he was saying something about a documentary called No Hunger in Paradise about players who come through the academy they get 22-23 and they've not played enough games but they've got all the flash cards and stuff like that even from that perspective clubs might start looking at sort of younger youth team players that have maybe just been released or get them on loan and they've got something to prove and they're playing against some lads will be playing for a mortgage you know at this yeah. level that does happen so I think yeah. it will sort of benefit was it um, Peter Jackson that gave you your debut by the way um, it's, uh, let me think now. No, it wasn't. The Peter Jackson was my second, um, uh, was the second. I'm trying to think who, who the, um, Wadsworth. Yeah. Mick Wadsworth. Sorry. Yeah. 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 It was Mick Wadsworth. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, it was the old, it was the old division two then, um, before it was obviously changed to league one and two. League one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so. We, I played that first season, you gave me my debut, I played um, maybe 30, 30 odd games that season. I was playing wide on the left of, of a three, um, four, three, three. I think I scored six goals, I think. Um, yeah. had, a, had a decent season, but didn't, you know, didn't, didn't <coughs> set it on fire, but you know, was working my way into the men's game and, and I enjoyed it, although it finished in, in relegation and then administration followed and a lot of changes at the club and then Peter Jackson came in and, and threw in quite a lot of the younger players, myself, sort of John Worthington, Nathan Clark, who, who's still playing now, um, Halifax. And um, yeah, we, we, we had a good a good nucleus of young, hungry players, and which touches on, on the last question. You know, there were lads who, who had been ball boys at the club, which we all had been, you know, throwing the ball back for the, for the lads. And, and then suddenly you're getting a chance to put on the shirt. It means, it means a hell of a lot, especially for your hometown club. So... Um, it, it, that season kind of bred a hunger and um, almost uh, a naivety, but in a good way because we didn't we didn't yeah. know what to expect. We were just going, you know, with no pressure, no no um, anything to to worry about. We just go and enjoy it and, and love playing for your for your team and and getting that chance. And and you know, from from then went well till January, and then I left to go to Blackburn. And the lads carried it on and and ended up getting promoted through the playoffs. So. It uh, it certainly worked for us as a club and got us got us back on the financial straight and narrow and then um, from then grew and, and ended up you know in, in ten years later being being a Premier League side so you know it, it's a it's a lovely way to do it yeah absolutely you talked about um, you went to Blackburn obviously in the January just before that I remember we talked off air about it I remember you absolutely tearing the arse out of our defence in the League Cup game I think it must have been nineteen twenty. Um, small crowd, but I remember going, I think it was 4-2. I think you scored twice, at least once. Um, and I remember after that, I'm guessing that's where Mick McCarthy saw you, but I'm guessing other people looking at you as well. So you've just started 18 months, you've been playing professional football. It's only been about 18 months, give or take. And you've got Premier League clubs getting linked to you. Um, what's that like? Does it add pressure or is it just more excitement and just like wanting to continue doing what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really know much about. Um, I knew there was people coming to watch, uh, mm. and, and I knew I knew Mick had sent somebody to watch. Obviously, um, a Championship side at the time. Uh, I didn't know of any real Premier League interest. I've not heard much from from Blackburn, and until it was a case of we've had, you know the gaffer pulled me and said we've accepted an offer from Blackburn. You know, we'd like to go and speak to them. That 
it was kind of happened that quick. So there, there wasn't really a long spell. There, there was, I knew there was people watching, but I, I didn't have anything, you know, concrete or anybody ringing me direct or anything like that. I don't know if it's probably a lot different now, but um, yeah, that, that was it. So until, until I, we finished the game and, and Jacko pulled me and just said, you know, we've accepted a bid, you can go. The next day I was at Ewood Park then watching them play against Chelsea, um, met the manager in a, met Sunas in a kind of stairwell behind the ground. Um, and he just said, you know, can, can you come and, can you come and play in this? And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, obviously me, I'm like, yeah, of course I can. Yeah. <laughs> I think, but secretly absolutely crapping myself. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, of course I can. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the, the following weekend I was starting for him. So it was, it was a, a real whirlwind and something that I, I couldn't really, um, I didn't anticipate. And, and it, it was quite probably hard for it to settle in because it happened so fast. Yeah, he's a huge character. I live in Glasgow. I know exactly all about Graham Sooners and that, what level he's, uh, the esteem that he's held in. He's a fiery, fearsome character. And that's why most of the pundits don't really speak back to him because I think he'll, he'll probably spot them through the window if they disagree. Yeah. But as a man, you know, I mean, maybe Newcastle fans would disagree, but I don't really care. Um, Sooners has he's done an all right job. He's, He's got a big set of balls on him. We all remember the Galatasaray moment. So what is he like as a man? Is he a little bit different or is he exactly as you expect? Um, well, you touched on it there. I think if he likes you, he's, he's a great person to be around. And um, he obviously he brought me to the club, gave me a huge opportunity and, and took a, probably what's seen as a, a massive risk with me as well. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of that happening at the time. There wasn't a lot of no. lower league players jumping straight up and, and people forking out the, the kind of money they did and and kind of taking that chance. It was almost seen as, oh, what, you know, what are you doing kind of thing. But as, as far as I read into it, he, he was quite... Um, he'd been falling out, obviously, with with some of the players that were already there and I think having, having a tough time and they weren't, obviously, uh, fighting at the right end of the table and stuff. So it probably forced his hand a little bit, but... Whenever I came in contact with him, he was an absolute gentleman. He was, he was very firm in his in his approach, but not in a not in an aggressive or nasty way towards me. You know, he asked questions, he demanded from you, but that's of my career. That's always been the type of manager which I prefer. Like, some, if somebody just keeps telling me I'm doing the right things and, and doesn't get on at me, I think that's when I when I struggle. So, mm -hmm. he, he was the perfect type of character for me because the the, the way. He, he demanded more. He could see, obviously, that I was young and a bit kind of rabbit in the headlights at times, but he, he knew how to manage that. And I probably gave him, I'd imagine I gave him less headaches and less worries than the likes of Coley and York. Maybe, you know, they're at different stages in their careers and they, they seem to clash a lot, even at, in training and stuff. You know, there, there was a lot of clashes and, and arguments and, and bits and pieces. So I think I was probably seen as a bit of a... Um, a peaceful way and, and somebody that's definitely not going to answer back. I'm just happy to be there. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned about, um, you know, your first six months at Blackburn. They went really well. As you said, it was, I think it was, was 2.5 million that they spent. Is that right? No, it wasn't that much. I think they paid, uh, it was about, I think it was just over one and then it went up a little bit, I think, after that's right. that. So that at the time, like you say, it wasn't there wasn't really much happening then. There, there really wasn't. Like I remember it well, and it was a bit of a risk when they bought you. And I remember because I'd seen you in that game against Sun, and I remember thinking it's quite a jump that. But I think you scored like yeah. six and fourteen or something like that. So yeah. you, you talked to it really well first six months. And um, what was it that made you play so well in the first six months? How did that work so fast? Uh, I, I don't, well, I think I, I just carried on what I was doing. I'd scored. 16 or 17 I think up to the point of moving at Huddersfield so I was already in kind of that groove as a striker when you know everything you believe everything you hit is going to go in and and I kind of carried it on and I think because like I said there wasn't like a long transition between me knowing about the interest and knowing that I was moving to literally it was a week between playing games so it wasn't yeah. like I had a lot of time to um try and settle at a club or anything. It was just literally, you start training on a Monday and on Fridays, you're telling me that you're starting the next game. Um, so there, there was no time for me to worry about anything. It's like, it's there in front of you, go and enjoy it. And I think that's probably the way I attacked it. And I've still not been in a point in my career where I'd had bad times or I'd struggled scoring or I'd, I'd been in a negative frame of mind or, you know, the demons are creeping in or anything. I've, I'd not experienced that. So... I just kind of rode on that and then finished the season really, really well and, and we stayed up and everything was fine. And then um, Tunes, you know, leaves in the summer, which was a, a huge blow for me. 
Um, and Mark Hughes came in, and, and from then on, I, I, I didn't I didn't perform like I had been. I didn't feel as comfortable there. I didn't have a, as good a relationship with him. So it, it, everything was changed. And I think from that season, I, I was I was trying to get out as as quick as I could. Really, I wanted to get away and start playing again as soon as possible because I knew. I had, you know, could get that feeling that things things weren't as they were, and and it was time to move on, and and that chance came. It's funny you mentioned about um, Mark Hughes because it's a player you played with, obviously Paddy Kenny, but um, we had Paddy on the show a couple of months ago. And let's just be say, let's just say he's not a shrinking violet. He's very honest in what he says, and he, he didn't really like Mark Hughes as the, probably the best way to put it. But I've come across a few people I've spoken to. Obviously, Mark Hughes is I've never met him, but. Great striker in his day, you're a striker, someone that you were probably really excited to work on, even though he was not the guy that signed you. Um, but what was it that you didn't connect with, with Mark Hughes in particular? Was it any particular moment or was it just a personality clash? Um, I'd say, um, well, there wasn't a particular moment, and I, but I'd, I wouldn't say personality clash anyway because I didn't even get a chance to figure out what his personality was. He was very, very standoffish, very difficult to, to, to build a relationship with. Um, and and really hard to read, and uh, you know I, I wasn't playing regular, and I asked him you know two or three times if I could go on loan to play and, and prove what I can do and come back, and and they turned down every loan request that I made, and but I still wasn't getting in the squad. It was just a bit, it was all just a bit strange, and for, and for me that's that was the first time I'd seen that in a club where a manager was like that with me. So I didn't really know how to react or probably what was the right way to go about it. I just kind of just kept my head down and 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 just waited and and when when the move did come to Sunderland I was absolutely you know buzzing with it because I you know I thought yes it's a fresh chance I can kind of scrap that season and pick up where where I left off the first six months. Yeah. With um Blackburn talking about when you sort of first went we've touched on Yorkie and Cole potentially I mean obviously now Quinn and Kevin Phillips are the best strike partnership that ever existed especially in the yeah. premiership as we all know <laughs> um, but, but Yorkie and Cole were alright as well they won a couple of trophies here and there but looking through the squad I mean it actually took me back how much quality was in it you had Barry Ferguson who's obviously a legend up here at Rangers yeah. uh, Amoruso obviously a huge personality um, yeah. I imagine a real Lothario um, two guys oh, brilliant yeah fantastic player Um no disrespect to this field at all, but that's a jump. And a lot of really good players that you're going into, legends, to be honest. Um, what were they like as people? Or what's it like when you get to know a legend as a person? Did they always match or did they change? Did, are people different than what you expect? Um, not always. Not always. Um, I'm not going to go into detail of which, which match and which don't. But um, <laughs> I, I can honestly say that there, there wasn't anybody in that specifically that Blackburn group when like you say like Amoruso was was fantastic with me um, Yorkie brilliant and then you know and then linked up with him again at, at Sunderland and um, I think probably out of all of them probably Andy Cole was just the one who was who he wouldn't go out of his way to come and help me but having said that once I'd got up the courage to actually speak to him and, and kind of move towards him instead of just like whenever he looked at me put my head down and, and, <laughs> and panic uh, once I got past that stage and I actually spoke to him and, and asked him questions, he, he had so much time time for me and, you know, I'd had the answers, had um, would go in, in depth with different things about the game and stuff and and, it, and he ended up being somebody that I, I kind of, whether he knew it or not, somebody that I kind of would go to or confided in and, and would ask questions just, just because of the clarity of his answers and obviously the career that he's had as well. So, um they were they were all they were all good lads. There was some real cat like Martin Gams Pedersen, the 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 left winger. He he was Back a real legend. Yeah. yeah, a real strange character, but but brilliant in and around the dressing room. And um yeah, Barry Ferguson, you know, obviously Gary Flickcroft again was was a, an older um like the senior pro and Craig Shaw, you know, they they yeah. were the, the, uh, you know, they they were kind of the ones who who kind of put the arm around you, Lucas Neal and 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 really kind of um showed you the ropes and showed you what is what really because like, like you said I, I jumped from um, yeah. in comparison which is pretty much like non-league compared to that, to the Premier League so everything was very different you know the setup was different what you got what you know the people that were around you the amount of staff it was it was all very different so they were kind of the ones who would um, give me advice and, and tell me uh, when, if I was creeping up with the station uh, at any point they'd, they'd rein you back in very quickly 
I've heard some really good stuff about Yoki because I think because Yoki's got such a big smile and he looks so happy all the mm-hmm. time. I think people take it on board that he's just a chilled out, relaxed guy. But I've spoken to a few players who played with him at Sunderland towards the latter end of his career. And they were saying his standards were just so high, but he was so helpful with everything that he did. He would literally like, sit the young boys down and be like, no, don't do it this way, do it this way. And here's why. Mm-hmm. Was he like that with you as a striker? Because I imagine there's not many people better to learn from than Yoki. Yeah, it was it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Like like you say, a player that plays with a smile on his face. Um, the likes of him and kind of Ian Wright, they were like kind of my major heroes because they, they played the game as as you imagine yourself playing it, like yeah. you know, laughing and joking, giving it everything, getting stuck in, and, and that's kind of what attracted me to football. And it, he he was one of them who was who was even better in person once you meet him because. I think at the time, especially at Blackburn, there was obviously a lot of things happening in his personal life as well that were yeah. well documented. And, you know, it's it, it's quite different, you know, walking in and, and you know, sitting next to somebody when his, his face is all over the front of the sun and the star and everything. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird um, combination, but away from all the drama in his in his personal life, he was he was football mad, you know, was, was really, was a winner, uh, you know, fit, one of the fittest players I've, Played with, you know, did he do the bleep test and pretty much like finish the tape and still be laughing and joking at the end of it? You know, it was it was it was extremely gifted, like physically and and uh, and certainly dedicated to the game. He wasn't he wasn't the um, sort of the joker and the kind of um, he didn't disrespect the game. And I think that's probably the the vision that you get from the outside because you see all stuff that he's doing off the pitch and you think I oh, he must be the same in the train in the training ground and on the pitch but he wasn't he was yeah he, he gave he gave the game the respect it deserved when when he was in the training ground or on the pitch. I've heard some great stuff about Yoki. Uh really, really great stuff and a good midfielder at something weirdly enough. Um, yeah. really good yeah. older midfielder which is odd but um obviously we spoke for a little bit about Mick McCarthy and you mentioned that he was quite persistent in signing you and I think I think I remember that. I think I remember him wanting you before you even went to Blackburn. But how long had Mick McCarthy actually chased you then? Yeah, well, I knew he'd been he'd been interested. Uh, like I said, the uh, the season before I went to, I think he looked at me when I burst on when I when I, I didn't burst on, but when I started playing for the for the first team, I think he'd been looked then. And then when I went to Blackburn, they what they wanted to do it then as well. So um, I knew he'd been chasing me for a while. So like I said, once. I got that opportunity. I thought, yeah, this is this because I, I knew the type of you know manager he was, the type of yeah. character he was, and I thought he, he's my kind of manager. He's he's the sort of person that I need to get myself back going again. And I've had a little hiccup. Like, let's get you know, let's get your career back on track and move in the same direction, which it was before that second season at Blackburn. So I felt like he was definitely the person to do it, um, and felt like I, I owed it to him as well because because he'd been so persistent in trying to sign me. With um, Mick McCarthy, I've never interviewed someone who's played under him, and I'm talking from everywhere from Matt Jarvis, who had a really successful career with him, to Tommy Miller, no disrespect, didn't do so well under him, and I think he'd be quite open and honest with that. They've all said the same thing, um, just dead honest, you just want to play for him, and he's just the nicest guy, and he always makes you feel like you can be approached, but how high does Mick McCarthy rank? And bear in mind, you know, it wasn't the easiest time for you at Sunderland, um, so you didn't get a great deal of time with him, but how highly does he rank, even though it was quite short? Well, first, I was very politely put, I like the way you worded that question. <laughs> I can see steam coming out of your ears. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, he, I mean, he was, like I said, he was the type that, that I felt I needed, and I don't have many regrets in my career. Obviously, my time at Sunderland, I was massively disappointed with how it went not just for myself but as as a squad as a, a team getting promotion and then wanting to kick on and all the all the um, the excitement and the and the passion that came with it for me for me at the time it was one it was probably a step too far i'd not experienced that kind of magnitude of a club um which which did shock me quite a lot when i got there and saw just you know what was happening it was um you know, I, I, I realised that very quickly, and I didn't have a great time. But the gaffer, he, he was always he was always brilliant with me. I think he was extremely disappointed, you know, rightly so. And the the one regret is not repaying, not doing for him what what he knew I could do. You know what I mean? And what I knew I could do. 
it wasn't wasn't for one of trying. You know, I was in at the training ground in the morning before training, swimming and, and trying to do anything, you know, just to try and spark spark that bit to get me going again. And, and it, it just wouldn't happen. And um, yeah, it, it was really frustrating and, and, a, and a, a real down point, really. But he, he was top draw, top draw with me, top draw with all the other lads, straight straight down down the middle, you know, ask him a question, you get the answer. Whether you like it or not, you're going to get the answer. And I think that's how managers should be. And it's, it'd be a lot easier for players and, and fans if they, were all, if they were all like that and everybody knew exactly what everybody was thinking. Because I think the one thing that f- football misses massively is honesty. And I think, you know, yeah. if, we, if we had more of it, it would be a lot easier to, to dissect and, and understand for everybody. Yeah, and I, yeah, I love Mick McCarthy. I think the job that he did just to get us there in the first place. I think, you know, talking before, we were like laughing before about the, t- the time you had at Sunderland, but in reality and in hindsight, you look at the team that he got up and I look at the team Sunderland have now. And I think the team on paper now is probably better than the team that he had that got us promoted. We were that on paper lacking in quality. And I think every player's mentioned this, you know, like Stephen Elliott when I spoke to him, Tommy Miller when I spoke to him, Dean Whitehead, Liam Lawrence. We never got battered that season. Not really. No. It was one goal here, two goals there. It was like the most frustrating season. Um, I'm just going to blame Kelvin Davis, if I'm honest with you. Um, <laughs> but you touched before about how you didn't, you probably didn't understand the magnitude of what Sunderland are. And I think a lot of people from outside of the North East, and I'll include Newcastle and Middlesbrough in this as well, think, yeah, huge clubs, really passionate. But I don't think they get it until they get there. Um, Absolutely. I was at a Charlton game when we got beat 3-1. Disappointing game. Remember Darren Bent scored twice. But at what point do you start realising like, oh shit, this is uh, this is a bubble. And it is a bubble. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I think it was probably there and then. It was um it was a a real kind of wake up call as to, you know, wow, this is can this can end up being a long season if we um if we don't apply ourselves. And I and I think you're right, we we didn't get we didn't get torn to pieces, but we just didn't have enough. We didn't have enough quality. Um, we certainly didn't have enough quality at the back of the pitch, and we didn't have enough at the front. You know, I think, and I think those were the were the key areas. Like you say, we struggled. We struggled um, to keep the goals out, and, and we certainly struggled to score them. You know, so what happens in both boxes, and we didn't do well enough in either. And it, it, yeah, it was it was really frustrating, and, and at times very dark that season. And um, I, I was witnessing that that scale of of negativity and and that's that's not saying there's anything wrong with that that's just saying that I'd not 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 seen that before I'd not seen that pressure of everybody kind of piling in on top of you and um it it became very uh very down at times but I think that's that's just something that you have to take on the chin and, and learn from you can't hide away from it I'm I'm still glad I, I went to the club. I'm still glad that I had the opportunity. I'm, I'm thoroughly disappointed that it didn't work out for me. But for, for me, I, I still didn't feel like it. I was playing terrible. I just couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. You know, I, yeah. you know, I was I was coming off games thinking, you know, if I was playing anywhere else on the pitch instead of a striker and a goal scorer, I'd probably be, you know, reasonably happy with my performance. But that's you know that's what I was brought to the club to do and and, and judged on ultimately and. And, and and that's it. And, and you take your medicine and you you try and put your head up and you, and you move on. And from there, I'm, luckily, I managed to do it. I managed to jump back to Sheffield United back in the Premier League and, and get get me five goals at the end of the season. So yeah. I knew it was there. I just it just it just didn't happen. And and I think um, we we spoke briefly about it. You know, off there. You know, there's there's been a lot that have been there and tried since, and yeah. I'm still trying. Um, and, and it's it's not taking off like like you hoped it would. So um, I'm hope I'm hopeful we'll get a bit more joy soon. Yeah, no, of course. And you know what? There's a I remember that season really well because I would have been about 2021. 20, so it was like one of those seasons where I was like, right, I'm going to go every week home and away. I wish I hadn't, but I did. <laughs> um, but I remember I think it was Everton, and it's it's more. It's more remembered for Alan Stubbs on the Sunderland bench celebrating the Everton goal. I don't know whether you remember that or how much of a myth yeah. it is. Um, but I remember that game. You came off man of the match. I remember you'd hit the post. You'd just gone past the post. And then they scored in the last minute. And it was just like, this is just our season. So at what point do you, I suppose as a club, more, more than individually, do you start going, right, we're, we're not good enough here, lads. This is... This is not going the way we want it to go. How early in the season did you just kind of click to that? Because the fans felt like it clicked in December. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> possibly before then. I think yeah. possibly before that. I think um, I think anybody would be lying if they weren't looking around in the dressing room thinking where where's our win coming, where's our run of games coming. Um, the you know certainly nobody would be turning and looking at me and thinking, oh right, that's where, where that's where it's coming from, and, I, and I'd be doing the same to others. So. I, it's a it's a it's a tough pill to swallow. That it's a t- it's a tough realization, and one that not many people um, will admit to very often in football. They'll all be they'll all, you know it's easy to say, oh yeah, we knew, we were just going to we thought it'd turn at some point, but it didn't. You know, never mind. I think yeah. we knew. I think we knew we needed to we needed something special. We needed to turn a tide, which was um, which was starting to become toxic at, at, around the club because of the because of the bad start and and their when it's swinging that way, it's very, very difficult to one stop it and then to turn it round and start moving the other direction is even harder. So um, we we didn't we didn't even come close in in my opinion at the season. We didn't even there wasn't even a spell where we had two or three games to my uh, memory where we thought, oh right, this is it, this is the turning point. I just we never came. Yeah. We never had that. Yeah, no, very true. And I think very honest of you as well, because I think that's kind of how we felt, to be honest. So I think yeah. it's really honest. Um, there was a particular moment that I touched on before with Alan Stubbs. Now, of all the players that I'd look through the squad and go premiership quality, I remember Alan Stubbs signing and thinking he could be like the Steve Bold that we had under sort of Peter Reid. That never worked out with Alan Stubbs and there's never been a particularly good feeling with Alan Stubbs and Sunderland. Especially for me, I've got an intense dislike of him, which is strange for a guy I've never met. Um, and I'm sure he's a lovely fellow. I'm sure I'm just holding hate against him, which he doesn't need to. But did you ever get the feeling that Alan Stubbs just wasn't invested in Sunderland and wished he was at Everton? Because that's how it came across. And the rumours of him celebrating, I don't know if it's true, but the rumours of him celebrating an Everton goal on the Sunderland bench. Because he should have been more, shouldn't he? He should have been, a, he should have been yeah. that man. I'd, I'd, yeah, I, I don't agree with... He, he didn't want to be that. I didn't. I didn't get that impression from him day in day out. Um, yeah, I, I'd fit him into the same category which I could fit in probably all but two or three of the players that season that didn't do what they were supposed to do. Didn't didn't do their job. Didn't f- fulfil their their side of the bargain. Um, and if you get two, if you get two or three of them in an eleven that don't do what's supposed to, it's difficult. But when you've got pretty much a squad who who are playing under or not. Or not to the standard that um, that's expected of them, then it's going to come across like that. And uh, so, obviously, just just from that question, you <laughs> you're gunning for him, and I can see that. But I, I can honestly, and that's fine. I, I can honestly say, from from my point of view, um, watching him in training and, and and training with him, and the the way he spoke before games and the way he approached games, I didn't see that. Yeah. But once we set a foot on the pitch. I didn't see from him what I expected, as he'll be saying exactly the same about me. So uh, I think we can't argue with that either of us. I think it's an interesting thing because as a fan, you look at a certain person and you yeah. have this intense dislike for a certain person. Mm. I've never met him. He could be the nicest guy on the planet. And he probably is. But it's interesting because doing things like this, you get to speak to someone who was there all the time. And I've had in my head for 15 years, he didn't care, didn't try. Mm. But I've never, I was never in that dressing room. So I always find it quite an interesting thing because... What a fan can think and what a player who's actually sat in the dressing room can think can differ so much. So I all find it's worth sort of asking that question. I don't know if I've forgiven him yet, but you've, you've got me halfway there, all right? Yeah, I do that because <laughs> you, you, you do do that and, and I do yeah, that. Yeah, of course there's, you do. There's, there's, there's players that I can name that I, that, that I did feel like that they were they were doing what you, you said there. You know, there's players that I, can, that I could go through in my career where I've, I've felt like that and I've been sat next to them. But they've yeah. not had that from from the outside, you know. That's not been picked up on. So I think it, it swings both ways. But like I say, as far as, far as my view of him and, and my, um, I mean, I, I socialise with him, I go out with him and stuff around, and, and he, he was an absolute sound bloke, you know. And, and he, yeah. I tell you what, his son's a good player, Sam Sam Stubbs. He's uh, he was on he was on loan with us at uh, Notts County a couple of seasons ago, and he, he was a a really good player looks, looks like he'll do well. He went over and played in Sweden or Norway. I think he went over there and, and played. But um, I think he'll be a good player when he's older. I'd be surprised if he's not uh, knocking around at Championship in a couple of years. Yeah, Stubbs uh, he was a great player, really, wasn't 
great player. Exactly. I know, yeah, and he's he, he, he seen the same values that you'd expect from him, sort of, you know, mm-hmm. a, a hard, proper, just a proper throwback defender, you know, there's a defender that likes defending, which is hard to find, you know, yeah. they all, they all be, the other one who plays, don't they? But it's not... It's nice to uh, it's nice to see defenders that will you know for me playing against them that will stick an elbow on me, but then they'll take one back as well, and it and it becomes a battle, and you shake hands at the end, and, and you've enjoyed it instead of you know yeah. sitting half rolling around on the floor moaning because you you've left one on them. It's the, that you know for me that. defenders should be always like, well, right, okay, my turn next, and and as a striker, like, I'd welcome that. That's like that's that's what what's exciting about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I move on to sort of you going to Derby and, and Sheffield United, there's a couple of things I want to touch on with Sunderland. And I suppose this is from a more, again, a fan to a player perspective. Now, I, I remember this happening and I remember kind of laughing about it as a 19, 21 year old. And I'm sort of doing questions here and I'm, and I'm thinking, oh God, I wonder how that must feel to, to have that. Now, we spoke sort of last week. You've done it pretty much everywhere else. There was only really Sunderland that you struggled in occasional seasons mm-hmm. elsewhere. So mm-hmm. you, to concentrate solely on Sunderland would be wrong with me. Um, but I remember when you scored against Everton and I remember the relief on your face and I remember the relief for us because it was like, thank God, you know, he's got his goal. Like, mm-hmm. But then a shirt came out saying, I saw John Stead score a goal from one of our fanzines. Now, <laughs> how do you take that as a player? Because you're still a young lad. Does it hurt or do you just take it as humour? Do you know for a fact as a footballer that's going to happen sometimes. Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd even had situations before that, even at my early days in Huddersfield. You, you know what you, you know what you're going to get. You know what you're signing up for. And I think a lot of young, younger players now have got to accept that and and take a lot of it on the chin. And I know it's it's difficult because we're getting a stage now in society where you're not allowed to just take something. I you know, everything's yeah. wrong, and you're not allowed to say this. You're not allowed to say that. So at times, I think. The privileged position that we're, we're in, I've always felt that there's going to be things that are said or there's going to be things that are banter that, which if I was in the stand and I was with my mates, I'd, I'd be laughing and joking at the same thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it, and that's how it is. And I think you've got, you have to look past that. And I, and I did, it didn't affect me any more than not scoring did. You know, that yeah. I was already having a torrid time. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a T-shirt was going to tip me over the edge, you know, I've, I was already having sleepless nights because I couldn't put a ball in there. <laughs> it, was just, it was just another thing. I, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't a massive factor. Um, I'll put it that way. But uh, yeah, it, like I say, it, it's one of those things. And I, and I think when a, when fans probably got a, a right good laugh out of that, and you know, and they might have sold a few t- t- t-shirts, and I don't know if they went to charity or whatever. You know, there might be something nice that came out of it. And. And for a bad season and how bad we were, we were making things for the for the supporters that were watching. I think if you you can allow them a few few banner t-shirts here and then, it's going to put a few smiles on a few faces. <laughs> and I think that that became that was something that became like a gallows humour. But then, so right at the end, I remember I think it was Arsenal we played and Quinny was due to take over, and it was like he was buying the club for like a quid, and it was just like, oh god, we're, we're gone down. But hang on a minute, this is. This is going to be amazing. And I think, if I, if I remember rightly, I'm pretty certain that Quinny started you in most of the games. I think he played... Oh, yeah, I think Stephen Elliott was injured for a couple of games and he had uh, Kevin Kyle, I think, was just coming back. He would have played... Daryl Murphy. God, Daryl Murphy yeah. was playing. Um, mm. So, as much as a difficult season as it was and it got into, like, sort of gallows humour, like you say before... Mm-hmm. Quinny comes in and things just felt really positive. Um, did yeah. you feel like that was your moment? And you thought, right, okay, like put this in the bin this season, start afresh, and yeah. what was the championship? Kick on and, and do well. And, and how was now Quinn with you when that sort of stuff happened? Yeah, he, he was brilliant. Actually, he was brilliant with me, and um, he, he he was obviously disappointed with with how it had gone for me and and, and the club as a whole. And I think. Us as a set of players probably thought, thank God that season's ended. You know, we can actually start a season fresh. With the squad we had, we're probably thinking this is probably where we're fitting at the minute as a group of players. This is kind of, um, we weren't fitting in, we didn't fit in in the Premier League as, as a group. And I think that's very obvious. And I think we have to take, we have to take, um, Take take that on the chin and, and say, well, we didn't, we, and we weren't up to it. But with the championship, I think we thought, well, here's an opportunity where, with the group we've got, with adding a few and a, a few of the the kind of um, 
the golf's, you know, taken away from us a little bit and, and that season of doom and gloom and the, the lowest points and, you know, everything was stacking up on top. It's kind of a case of, well, here we go. There's, there's a new fresh start now and there's, a, there's, there's going to be somebody else in charge. I remember pre-season, I think we went down to Bath University, I think, for a week. Um, and, and Quinny came down, but I'm not even sure if he was there for all of it. And we were kind of training for a week pre-season without a manager. So there was still that kind of, well, we need somebody and a, and a force to drive this now. We've, we've kind of relaxed a little bit. When, you know, we've, we've kind of had to take that on the chin. We, we take whatever comes with it, the, 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 um, the disappointment and the, and, the, um, and the blame. We take it all, but now at least we can start rebuilding and think yeah. we can bring things forward again. And, and, and we didn't have a manager. So it, it, was, it was a strange start to the season, but, um, but to be playing and getting an opportunity was nice. I think always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, if you don't bring a striker in and they score what, one, one, two goals in, in that many games, you're not going to be there long. You know, I think I had that in the back of my mind. There's going to be, there's either going to be somebody else coming in and you're going to have to fight for it, which I was pre- prepared to do, or every opportunity they're going to be trying, <laughs> trying to get you out the door, and, and, and that's life. That's life. So, um, I, I had an inkling my, my days might be numbered, um, and then we, we, you know. We didn't start the season brilliant, and then you, you, you're wondering, you know, what's what's next, really? Yeah, and the, what was next was Roy Keane. Um, <laughs> of all the people that could walk in the door, I think at the time, especially Roy Keane walking in the door was just like bizarre. I remember getting the I was on the coach back from Berry, and I remember the radio was on. I was going to say the wireless there that was really making me feel really making me <laughs> yeah. feel. Even, even um, I'd have had to say, what do you know about this? <laughs> and he goes, oh, I'm going to bring in a, a world-class name as a manager. And people are going, oh God, he's got Van Hal, he's got O'Neill and all that. And then when it was Roy Keane, it kind of made sense. You're like, oh, world-class name, but no. all right, okay, fair enough. As a player, be honest, did you shit yourself? A little bit. Yeah. yeah, I shoot myself, but at the, at the same time, and I've had I've had this kind of relationship with him because I've had him at, obviously at two clubs at Ipswich as well. And yeah, he's the sort of person who you're so desperate to 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 be liked. You know, there's a real kind of drive to like because you see the way he is. I mean, you see him now on on his punditry and stuff. He, he's he's not the easiest man to please and to get a smile out of. So I think that burning desire to to actually have some to gain some kind of respect from Roy Keane is like the Holy Grail, in, yeah. in, in my opinion. So it was like, you know, what can I do yeah. to make Roy Keane think that I'm all right and I'm a decent professional and I'm a proper person? I'm not just another <laughs> throw, throwaway footballer that he's disgusted with. You know, that, that's that's what it was like with him. And as soon as he came in, he, he made it clear very straight away that I wasn't going to play. But he was never he was never off with me or or anything. It was just a case. Look, it's it's not happened for you. Um, we can't wait around for it to happen. Um, we've got clubs um, in the championship that will take you on loan. You know, I think it's a good idea if you go and get some games. And I was like, oh, cool. yeah, fantastic. So it was Leicester and um, Leicester and Derby. So I went, I said, well, would you mind if I, if I go and speak to both of them? Can I go and meet the manager? Because normally loans, it's just like, oh, these want you on loan. Just go, go and sign. And then that's it. But I, I felt it was such an important stage for me I didn't want to just say oh well whatever you know you decide where I go I'm not really bothered as long as I'm playing so I went and met them both and ended up deciding to go to Derby and and it turned out being a really good move for me and I think and, and when I came back I, I just thought I might have a chance now and then it was kind of within a couple of weeks it was like no we've accepted a bid from Sheffield United and at the time I was disappointed but on the other hand it was a Premier League club that and Neil Warner the type of manager that that I, that I wanted to work for, um, so it ended up being being a, 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 another good mood for me, and I ended up leaving on decent terms with him. So it wasn't a massive, a massive yeah. issue. The only thing was, I knew he didn't really rate me as a player. So and that, and that was the, the bit that hurt a bit. That mm-hmm. obviously he didn't think I was up to it, and, and didn't he didn't really rate me. So I think that's that was kind of a little nice. It wasn't that he thought I was a, an idiot or you know a bad professional it was just he didn't really rate me as a player so that's yeah. not a nice thing from that sort of standard of player it's not a nice thing to 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 realize were you there when I pray you were because if you weren't this is going to fall flat on the task but were you there when you had a fight with Liam Lawrence 
Uh, well, I was, I was. We didn't see the fight. It apparently, happened in the in his in his office. Apparently, um, I think he offered, he offered a few out. I think. And I think. Um, I don't know if Dean White had had a little um, got offered out by him as well. But I remember, I remember Lenny going into the going into his office, um, and literally within ten minutes of being in office, they'd, they'd accepted a bid from Stoke for like five hundred grand or something, and, it, and he'd gone straight away, and that was it. And he like came out, and went right, so he's still you're off because. Me and Lenny spent a lot of time together, and we, we, we're still close mates now. So it was, um, yeah, it was an interesting one, and he, he said it was an interesting uh, meeting in the office, shall I say? Anyway, yeah, he had a go him on the, the pitch, didn't he? Like you kind of got to respect that anyone having the balls big enough to have a go at Roy Keane, like that, yeah. that made me respect Liam Lawrence more. I mean, I, I always love Roy Keane the most. Don't get me wrong, but to actually have a go back, you just think, bloody hell, mate, you've got some balls on you, like. Yeah, well, I've been on a, in a few spots with Liam before where he's dusted a few, to be fair. So he's, um, yeah, he's, he's not shy of, um, of of either speaking his mind or showing somebody what's what if they're, if they're running the mouth too much. So, and, uh, yeah, he's, he's the sort of person you'd want in your trenches anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I do like Liam Lawrence and he did well at something, to be fair. He, he did, did, very, he did well. very well, yeah. He did. Good player and a good career yeah. as well. Um mm-hmm. But moving on from Sunderland, uh, one of my favourite people that ever existed on the planet is Neil Warnock. Like, I hope he exists forevermore. I hope he's like Highlander where you've just got to chop his head off before he goes anywhere. But um, how, how quality is Neil Warnock? Hey, amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I loved every second um, playing for him. Uh, I can remember signing and, and going down to his office and... Um, you know, I sat down in his office and he was scrambling around trying to get all the paperwork and, um, you know, there was stuff everywhere on his desk. And, you know, it's a, it's a real, it's a real shit tip and there's stuff everywhere. And I'm thinking, what on earth's going on here? And he's, he's scurrying around trying to find a, find a pen and stuff like that. And then, um, and as I'm, he's like, here's some sign, get these signed. And I'm signing the paperwork and he, and he like, he, he nudges me and, and like, I look up and he goes, hey, so I bet you never thought you'd sign a contract like this again, did you? <laughs> After what you've been through up there, and I was like, I was like, all right, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was that kind of like friendly, um, friendly man management that was just was was a real change for me. I, you know, and something that I wasn't sure. I thought, yeah, he's, he's obviously he's, he's a straight talker. He's he's one of them that I know he'll he'll put a rocket up me. He'll you know he'll, he'll get the best out of me. But then to see him day in day out, it was just like. I don't want to say like Mike Bassey because it's like it's a bit disrespectful. <laughs> isn't it? But I, mean, I, mean it in a, I mean it in a genuine way that he can get a group of players to enjoy playing for him and want to want to do anything for him. You know, it's like the end of training at Sheffield United, like you know, Jags, uh, Phil Jagger could put goal, goalie gloves on and we'd all take shots at him and stuff like that, and you know he'd be joining in as well. It was just a real, there was just a real good feeling about Sheffield United uh, that season, and. It, I walked into a changing room where I instantly felt comfortable. Uh, you know, I felt, I felt at home and I knew it was a good fit. Thing is, with, uh, with Warnock, I've heard this a few times and Paddy Kenny confirmed it, but is it true that if you've got beaten, he's in a rage with you? Like, he'll come in, not let any of you move away. He'll gradually start stripping off, going in the shower, still running that. You come back in, put his pile of cream on his arse, apparently. Yeah. Still doing it and then let you go. How true is that? That uh, crystal, absolute crystal, too. Yeah, that, <laughs> exactly the same thing. He'd walk in, he'd, he'd, he'd be quiet for a while, he'd be kind of rumbling and, and chuntering to himself, and then he'd have a go at one, then another, then another. And then before you knew it, he'd like to say, bollock naked, one leg up on the on the bench that you sit on, you know, f- fiddling cream into his ass. So it was it, but while he's still having a pop at people. So, and like, obviously, everybody's like sat there, like trying, <laughs> trying to keep a straight face, and he's going in, like, he's just absolutely. Tearing people to pieces um, and bowling round absolutely starkers. So it, yeah, just it was a very, it was it was a brilliant time at Sheffield United. I absolutely loved it, loved it to bits. And that season, like, was a was a real eye opener. Just just for the, the difference of it and the the comedy at times and and the camaraderie and the and the group of players and the staff. It it was a real it was a joy to be there. You mentioned before about the, you said it might have been disrespectful to say that the Mike Bassett comparison, but I get what you mean. Like the film, when you watch the Mike Bassett film, you want him to do well. You want to get yeah. behind him and you want to be like, oh, I just love this guy. Like he's a bit daft, he's a bit funny, but I just want to, I want to see him succeed with England. But obviously that, that's Warnock, isn't it? That, that's just yeah. him. 
That's that's him, yeah. But you know, his knowledge for the game and his his man management skills are, are, are the best I've ever seen. You know, he knows how to deal with each individual. I think for every manager, if it, the, when I look at things for myself, what I'm going to do next, whether it's coaching or management, you know, or something within the game, I always think that that is the biggest challenge is is figuring out who who reacts to what. So yeah. how do I deal with one player compared to the next? Because if you blanket the squad and, and treat them in one way, you, you're only going to you know get through to maybe a third of them if you're lucky. Yeah. So I think to, to have that ability to know how people work and respond to the to, to how you are to them is is genius. And and I think that's why he's still the manager that it is. He can be he can be daft and and, we, and everybody can take the the mick every now and then and, and stuff that he does and his mannerisms. But what he does is he gets. He gets players to play above their level, and and that's that's what he's renowned for. And I, and I, I like you, like you. I hope he carries on doing it forever. Yeah, I hope he, I hope he never ever ever retires. I mean, um, I'm obviously a Sunderland fan, but I work with uh, Middlesbrough women, so I work with a lot of Borough fans. And I remember the day you got appointed, we were at training, and you just seen the whole lot of them. They were like for weeks though, like we're going to get relegated. Oh, we're going to be playing news mm-hmm. next season. And then I went, oh no, we're going to stay up. And now it'll be playoffs next yeah. season. That so he does just lift. He does lift an atmosphere because he's just he's one of the the game's greatest ever characters, in my opinion. Um, I think it's, a lot of people, it's easy to turn your nose up at him, isn't it? So I think it's easy, so easy to say, well, no, no, we're better than that. You know, that's not the type of person we want. And then as soon as they get to the club, they realise that that's, that's who, who they want in their corner. That's who they want Sunderland. fighting for him. Yeah. would love him at Sunderland. Take him in a heartbeat. No problem at all. <laughs> um, you went to Ipswich. Uh, had a great first season under Jimmy Jilton. But then mm-hmm. Roy Keane came in again. Did you get a similar... Similar feeling that as soon as Roy came in, it was like, ah, oh, he doesn't like us. Does that affect your confidence? Or was he quite honest and say, look, you know, I didn't rate you previously. You're not going to stay because you played a few games in the second season, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it was a weird one. That, like you said, the first season I went with Jim, and, and I, we had a we had a good season. I think we finished just outside the playoffs, and yeah, we um, we had a, a really good style of football. I think. That, that season before I joined, they had a real kind of reputation for you know all this kind of total soccer, and, and Jim kind of kind of drove that, and, and it was a it was a great place to go and play a lo- lovely part of the world, and and again in, enjoyed my time down there. And as soon as the as soon as they left, and then the new manager was coming in, and I remember being at home. I was in we were renting a house in in Bury St Edmunds, um, not far from Ipswich, and. Um, had Sky Sports News on, and it, and it just it just literally out of nowhere. It wasn't even like rumour. It just popped up on the yellow thing, like Roy Keane takes over the manager of the switch, and I was like, oh, so I looked to turn to my missus, I was like, start back in. So how, how long's left on this lease? So I was like, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we might be moving on. And, and then the initial thoughts were like, oh no, like I'm, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, and I went in and, and, and I sat down and, and had a chat with him and, and my first, my first thought of like chat with him was good. It was all right. It was kind of he didn't like like you say he didn't walk in and say you know I don't you know I don't fancy it. Like I proved it before. Like you know let's let's work on how we can figure out how to get you away and get you playing or whatever. It wasn't that wasn't really the case. I think um, I think I'd, I'd started to win him over a little bit, maybe purely because of the decision that I decided to go and speak to both clubs Leicester and Derby he said because when I told him that he was like oh well, that's refreshing like you actually want to go and speak to the manager and see if it's a good fit he said that doesn't happen very often with loans and for me at the time I was thinking well why why doesn't that happen because surely you want to yeah. know who you're playing for and, and how they see you fitting in with the team but anyway so yeah so the initial was all right and then um obviously we had quite a few strikers and he, he brought a few in as well and I was thinking, mm, I'm not going to get a massive amount of games, but I played, I played on and off, and and um, and did all right. wasn't wasn't scoring as freely as I was the previous season, but I wasn't. I was doing okay, um, and then um, started drifting out of the team a little bit, and then um, Bristol City were interested in signing me, and that came on. I think it was a Wednesday or the Thursday, and the club agreed a free, and um, and the chairman rang me and said, "Oh, um, we've agreed a fee with." With uh, Bristol, you can go over and speak to them on Thursday. I was like, right, okay. So I go over to Bristol on Wednesday night, do all my medical on Thursday, signed all the paperwork and everything. And at eleven o'clock, I get a phone call from um, the the man, Roy Keane's assistant at the training ground. Where are you? I was like, what do you mean, where am I? I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm going. Like, 
they agreed to free, and I'm obviously I'm not training, so I'm signing and doing all my medical and paperwork at Bristol. And she was like, all oh, right, the manager had no idea. So so he was expecting me to train on Thursday. So I was like, what's what's happening here? So I came back and came in, came back into um into Ipswich on the Friday, and the gaffer was like, Oh, I need you to play. And I think we we're playing QPR away on the Saturday. And um, no, we we're playing Crystal Palace on the Saturday, and he was like, Oh, I need you to play. And I was like, Well, I've signed, I've like signed for Bristol. He's like, well, have you dated it? And I was like, well, no, I haven't dated it, but I've done my medical, like everything's agreed. It's all, it's done and dusted. And he was like, well, I need you to play. What are you going to do? And I was like, I was like no. <laughs> so obviously half of me is like, well, if I get injured, I'm knackered. You know, if I, if I get injured or something happens to me on Saturday, then this, this paperwork's just going to get torn up. But then half of me was like, it's Roy Keane. I've got a chance. I've got a, I've got a chance here to like for him to think I'm a good person, that I'm a top pro, like I'm, that I'm that I'm worthy of some kind of respect from him. So so I was like, I was like, well, okay, well, I'll get my agent to speak to Bristol and we'll do the deal on Monday. So I ended up starting the game um, against Palace. Played the game. I, I can't remember the, the score, but I had a decent game, and um, and then I left then on you know on the Sunday or Monday and went to Bristol City and. And I've, I've spoken to him since, and um, when he was coaching at, at Knox Forest, uh, he's spoken to our goalkeeper, Coach Mark Crossley, and uh, and he actually asked Mark Crossley how I was getting on. He's like, how's, how's Steady doing? He's top top pro. Like, um, he was brilliant for me, and, and all this, and I and I'm like, no, I'm sorry, Mark Crossley's telling me, and I'm like, what? He said he said I was a good pro. I said I was alright. <laughs> so, so finally, I mean, still probably rate me as a player, but. I was I was happy that at some point he thought I was a I was worthy of some kind of like slither of respect from him. So it, end, it ended up a, a, a decent end to what was a, a turbulent time with Roy at two clubs. And I, I'd like to think now I've seen him a few times since, and he's always been decent with me. So I, I'm I'm not one that he'd, he'd turn away and not speak to, which is nice to know. <laughs> Only if Liam Lawrence ever made up with him. I'd, I'd be very doubtful of that. I, th- I think if them two are in a room again, I, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> I'd like to see that. I'd pay per view for that. No yeah, problem. I'd, I'd pay 15 oh, quid yeah. for that. And I was going to say, I've seen a lot of bad UFC fights. I think that's <laughs> yeah, same. Um, <laughs> Bristol City, and obviously, the day you had, you've got a really good relationship with Bristol City fans. Obviously, you had a successful yeah. time there. Um, the main thing that I pulled out from Bristol City was the fact that you played under Derek McInnes. I know he didn't bring you to the club. Um, mm. but he's been supremely successful with Aberdeen but yeah. one thing that always surprises me outside of Sunderland nobody's tried to take him from Aberdeen um, yeah. are you surprised no big clubs have come in from because yeah. he's built up a really reputation and he's obviously got something about him massively gone re- really well with him him and Doc as assistant got, I, you know, I had a fantastic time with him and loved the way that they worked and their, their energy and their enthusiasm towards it was was brilliant, and I was I was genuinely gutted when they left um, Bristol City because you know, like I say, a really good relationship, and they were growing into it. I think at the time, I, I don't know whether um, the unknown of of the English game maybe maybe caught them a little bit, maybe at the start, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm, it's a strange one. It's, it's strange that it's not happened yet. Yeah, because, I think so. um, <laughs> the, the the drilling out successful season after season and. Yeah, I think they've obviously got a good relationship up there, haven't they? And, and, and it's quite tight and, and they're obviously comfortable there. But I think they're, they're definitely um, a management team that deserve more of a crack to try and jump the ladder a bit more and, and take that next step. And I think ultimately it's probably something that they'd want to do. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm surprised and I couldn't give you a reason why, um, why that hasn't happened. And it's like, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm saying big clubs, I would eat a huge. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I suppose you'd expect them to maybe try them sort of in even the championship or something like that. Because yeah. I think, and with all due respect to Aberdeen fans, I think if he moved to, say, Sunderland at the time that he did, there was a reason that he would have moved. And I think because mm. of the size of some of those clubs in that division that you could probably go to and, and do a good job yeah. with. Um, Talking of managers, though, uh, obviously you did have a spell back on loan at Huddersfield and then you went on loan to Oldham for a little bit. But now this is this could be a controversial question. I said there was no controversial ones, but there might be one. Um, but it might be more Outside controversial. Might be controversial for the way that you answer it. But Phil Parkinson, um, 
I would say universally not massively loved at Sunland, and I could be wrong mm. with that, but not not hated either. Just no one was too enthused by his appointment. But you've worked yeah. under him during a really successful time. Now I had Aaron McLean on the show who didn't connect with him at all. Um, but you, on the other hand, played under him a lot and played under him a lot in some really good cup runs, really good league runs. What is Phil Parkinson like? Uh, it, if, if I could put him along the same lines of any other manager, it, his style it is a Mick McCarthy style. I think that's that's the way he is around the players. He's very... He was very direct with us, um, had a style of play and the way he wanted to play. And he had players that could go and execute it. Um, I think the difference is, what I see the difference is now, is the style that we were playing at Bradford probably doesn't fit a Sunderland. You know, it, it, it's a different way of playing. And I think that that's probably that initial spell where it, there'll be a bit of time for that adjustment. Um I thoroughly enjoyed working for him. I knew exactly where I stood. Uh, I knew my roles and responsibilities, and you were you were allowed to go and and and, and do that. You know, fulfil that. And the staff that he had with him was superb. Goalkeeper coach, fantastic. The fitness coach, Nick Allenby, is one of the best I've worked with. Absolutely huge, brilliant. Hugely highly rated. He had a lot of people. Obviously, the season ended, but when he came in, and I think it was November, we went through a horrendous run when he first came in. I mean, mm. truly, I part of my friendship yeah. was fucking terrible. Um, yeah. And I think it was quite vocal. People wanted him out. Our upturn form came in a line with Nick Allenby coming in. Um, so I wasn't going to touch on it, actually, because I forgot about that. But Nick Allenby, like, what can he bring to the club? Do you think he would have had a lot to do with that? Do you think the upturn form? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think the, the group as a whole, I think... He, the guy, he, he seems he needs his people around him. Okay, so he, he needs his assistant, he needs Butts, the goalkeeper coach, who's a bit of the, the joker, but the, the hard man. Um, and he needs Nick, who, who drives a, a desire. In the, and I mean, for us playing only a couple of weeks ago, um, I mean, Harrogate for me it is the fittest group of players I've worked with and, and been a part of. The unbelievable and that has been our strength over the last last 18 months has been working teams and people are turning around and looking at us thinking how how are they doing what they're doing physically demanding yeah, you, on you a looked it in the friendly yeah yeah you did but, but but i tell you what the the opposition Sunderland is the first time in a long time that we've come up against an opposition that are still going you know they're still they're still going that last 10 minutes and for, for a club to be to be matching us and, and going toe to toe in in that respect was was very impressive, and I've got no doubts that that's down to um, to obviously Nick's um, expertise and and a group of players that want to do it as well. And I think that's that's nice to see. It's nice to see a group that are obviously the you know the lads that that we saw and that we played against. None of them were none of them were big time or arrogant or anything. They seemed a group of players which I'd expect. From, from the manager, which is a group that are willing to work, they're willing to run, and they're willing to put a shift in. And and those things, I, I know from playing at Sunderland, they're a massive part of whether you are successful or not, not just in, at the football club, but in the surroundings and, and with the fans as well. And I think they showed that. They showed that aggression and that desire to go and work and, and, and want to do well. So, like I said before, early in the interview, I don't think there'll be an issue. I think he's going to need a little bit of time because there, there's a slight change in, you know, with the three at the back. And um, I don't know how much he's done that. It was always seemed to be quite a straight 4-4-2. Yeah, and, I uh, it was. You know, work, yeah, working on angles and, and, and looking at patterns of play and, and maybe playing for position rather than possession to start with, but then playing in their half. And these are all things that normally work better Towards the lower ends of the leagues, and and I think to try and um, to try and mirror that with the style of play that you need to be effective to score goals higher up, I think it's a difficult it's a difficult blend to get right. So it'd be nice I, for me personally. It'd be nice to see him get the time and the support to to go and do that. Um, and if they start the season really well, they, they can be an absolute powerhouse. And I think everybody had had recognised that. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed. But yeah, I've I've got nothing but good things to say about him. But I had, I had a successful period with him, and I enjoyed working with him. And I'm, um, I'm sure the players, if they buy into what he's about and his ethics as a person rather than a manager, 
then I think they'll do well for him as well. I think when we're talking about um, Phil Parkinson as well, the one thing that really stuck out about your time at Bradford was, and I remember watching it and I'm thinking, bloody hell, how's the manager that? Chelsea away. Mm. Like, oh we need God. to discuss that. Like, you tune it, for those who can't remember, which I'm sure many people do, 2 0 down against the stars of the Chelsea team that have never lost any games at home under Mourinho, I think. Um, Bradford City, League, League Two at the time, League One, League yeah, One, the League One, yeah. turn up what three, four goals, second half. Um, uh, how do you sum that game up? Like, what was it like it being was, on the pitch? It was, it was madness because we found ourselves 2 0 down after I think it was only after like 20 25 minutes, and both goals were like the kind of goals that you'd like want to hang yourself for, you know, like yeah. one was a set piece, one was a, a corner. Um, Gary Cale nicks in and, and scores at the front post, like you know, which is a lower league team. Yeah, a lower league team playing playing against the higher team. What do you what do you guarantee? Don't score from set pieces. You know, do do the basics. If we get half chances here and there, then try and take them. Yeah. So to, to lose out to that goal first, and the second one was a, a really sloppy pass in the in the middle of the park. Um, a quick counter, one two goal. So then suddenly it's like, oh no, this like. Let's not embarrass ourselves now. Let's make sure in the cricket scores. Just show up, show up, get into, get into half time. And then luckily I managed to get a goal just before half time. So literally the whistle blows pretty much after the scored. And then we're going in 2 1. So it's like almost like, oh, thank God we scored. We've had, yeah. you know, had 6,000 fans there. They're all going mad. We're like, we've scored away at Chelsea. That was almost like winning the game in itself. Like we've, we've got a goal. Um, so going into half time completely obviously changed the dynamic of the, of the team talk, as you would expect. Yeah, and we and we come out for the second half with with a, a lot more belief. Um, disappointed that we conceded two crappy goals, but positive in the in the in the frame that they've not carved us open. They've not done anything spectacular to warrant their their gap in stature of, of the clubs or their position in the leagues. So we'll kind of just go out and enjoy the second half, give it everything, see what happens, and then as the game went on, then it just it just got. Sillier and sillier as the as the game went off, and then things that were happening were unreal. And we we all played the, the games of our careers. Really, we had to be tens out of tens across the board to have any chance anyway to to get a result. And and we did it. And and luckily they were probably at sixes and sevens as well. So everything kind of tilted and balanced in our favour. And and we managed to to capitalise on it. And still to the to the day, you know, one of the. One of the top moments in my career it was it was fantastic. Loved it. I was going to say, do you, would you class that as the greatest game you ever played in? Uh, it's, it's my best <coughs> performance. It's, it's my, my best, best all round game that I've played in. Um, we've played in some some good games that have had obviously significant um, outcomes and stuff. And the, you know the, the major one, Harrogate, obviously, obviously to win at Wembley and get promoted was a huge huge thing for me in my career. I've not had many promotions and. Um, to be a part of it was was massive and to be part of that history for a club, you know, taking a step into the Football League for the first time, whether people want to turn their nose up, oh, it's, well, it's National League, why are you buzzing? You've been promoted from National League because you, if you've played in the Premier League or Championship, doesn't matter. Still, that meant more to me than, than making my debut in the Premier League. You know, that's, that's how you are in that moment with that group and know how much it means to everybody around you. Um, and I think that probably comes when you're older. You get a, you get a clearer view of, of what, Football is to people that are in and around the club. I think when you're younger, you're just kind of there and you, you leave the training ground, you go home and you come back. Whether you do good, bad or indifferent, your life wouldn't change that much. Yeah. There's a, a, a massive, bigger picture, um, how it affects people in and around the club. And I think you, you do, you get more of a sense of that the older you get, definitely. Um, and it becomes it becomes more important. I've got to ask a question before moving to Nuts County and we finish up, but... I, I make no secret of this. I, I'm very, very fond of Glasgow Rangers and have been pretty much since I've, I've been in Glasgow. Um, one of the, the biggest blue noses that I think I've ever came across was Andy Halliday. You played with Andy Halliday. Yeah. Um, simple question. What's he like and how big of a blue nose is he? He's a legend. He, he's um, he's a real... A real uh, addictive character you know he's the type of person that you want to be around he'll yeah. he'll run his mouth at times he'll say things that he shouldn't he'll he'll uh, he'll be aggressive uh, at the wrong times but all those things putting together is for me create people that you you want to be you want to be in the company of you you want to see what they're going to do next 
Absolutely. you want to you want to try and push your button to see if you can get more out of them, you know. And he, he was a top top player as well. He did yeah. brilliant. He did brilliant when he was at Bradford. A, a real tenacious, you know, aggressive, passionate player. And I think the they are a dying breed. That that type of player are a, a, a few and far between now. So. Um, yeah, love spending time with him. Love love playing with him. Um, he scored a great goal in that in that Chelsea game as well. He did. Scored a fantastic goal. Twenty five yards drive on it, if I remember right. Yeah, it was his a, left foot. yeah a, a brilliant setback to him, and uh, and then he uh, yeah and he let rip. So it's um, yeah, he's absolute top man. Yeah, and lo- loves his Rangers. Can't, can't take that away from him. Yeah, like apparently his email address is something like uh, Glasgow Rangers, like WATP at gmail.com or something like that. It's just like, surprise me. how did I know that was your email address? Um, I'm sure it's something different. So don't send him any emails. I don't have any prior information, which is from another podcast I watched. Um, on uh, sort of Notts County, um, you spent four years at Notts County under mm-hmm. Kevin Nolan. Um, Let's not speak about him because I'm a Sunderland fan. Um, and I never, ever will forgive him for those three goals. But <laughs> not count these topsy to every time as a club. Um, so my final question would that be on the Notts County. How much of a toll does boardroom unrest or takeover uncertainty have on a player on the pitch on a Saturday? Uh, that's a good, it's a good question. Now. It's a tough one as well to answer it. My four years there were, you get to this stage of your career and I thought, well, I've pretty much seen a lot. I've seen administrations, relegations, promotions. You know, I've seen tough and good times at a lot of clubs and seen stuff go off in changing rooms and yeah. stuff with managers and thinking, well, you know, what else could there be? But that four years there was, yeah. <laughs> was absolutely mental. There was It was daily stuff happening, you know, going off the... That was so strange, and the staff didn't know what was happening. The, the managers didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was happening from above. We had a, a, a kamikaze chairman that came in, and then was was making life even harder for everybody. And it was really tough. But then, when I go back to your question, a, a lot of that you, players are sheltered from it. You know, the, although it's happening, and you know it's happening, and you can see how it's affecting maybe your staff and, and other people around the club and the office staff especially, you can see how it's impacting on them. But as far as us as players, it, it, it shouldn't really affect you that much. I mean, we're, we're in a massively privileged position as players. Our contracts are completely secure. You know, yeah. they're, they're like, they're ironclad. It's ridiculous. Like, you know, anybody else in any line of work, you're not doing your job for, for six months. That's it. You, you know, sorry, it's not working out. Off you go and... I wouldn't have spent six months at Sunderland if that had been the case. But, <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? Like, but that's but as players, you, you you're very very fortunate, and, and we are, and we know it. That you know your your jobs are secure, no matter what happens. Even if even if the club go into administration, more than likely the PFA will pick it up, and you get your money or you get some of it. You know, for, for office staff, that's it. You know, pack your bags, you're not getting a penny. You know, yeah. so I think you've got to. I've always thought as a player, you've got to keep that in perspective and think that no matter what's happening outside, I'm away from that. And your job is solely to, to perform and, and do what you should do on the pitch. So if, if there's ever a point where as a player you're saying, oh, well, I'm struggling to concentrate on the game because of everything's happening behind the scenes and all that, then you shouldn't be playing the game. You know, that is, that is part and parcel of you having to compete at that level with all the with all the stuff that you get for doing it, all the privileges that you get, that's one of the things where you have to go, right, okay, don't let that affect me. Yeah. Uh, and if it is, I've got, I've got to hide it. Don't be telling people that that's, that's what's causing you because it's a, it's a cop-out. Were you there when the chairman posted that photo on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> See, that was just like that. that wasn't <clears throat> even a shock. That wasn't even something that we that was a surprise to anybody. It was I just felt like, so bad there, for him. Like there he goes again. Yeah, but worst thing was he, he came in then and like got everybody in like the like one of the big suites upstairs and like literally stood there in front of everybody and like explained like how it happened and. Like what a mistake it was, and it was a, it was on the pictures at the bottom of his um, his photo, like searches, and we all knew like, that. Basically, saying it was it was it was playing it was playing what do you say it was playing golf and um, 
it, I was supposed to be playing golf and they're all in the golf group. They're like, oh, where are you now? What are you doing now? Like, where, you know, we're teeing off at this time, whatever. And he was in the bath. So he just tried to send a picture of his feet in the bath, apparently, to send to his golf group. <laughs> he sent a picture of his golf. <laughs> uh, so that was his excuse. I don't know how true that is, but um, that's what he was going with. <laughs> going with and he stuck with it, so I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it was it was bad. I mean, it, I, I did, as funny as it was, I did, I did feel sorry for him because obviously yeah. you don't want that. He's, he's you know, he's, he's, tr- he's trying to, he put a lot of money into the club. He did, I'm sure he did a lot of things that he, he shouldn't have done and, and made a lot of bad decisions. But at the end of the day, he put his hand in his pocket and he wanted to make the club better. Um, probably the, there might have been too much of that wanting to make himself more um, more relevant and, and more sort of in the, in the limelight rather than the yeah. club. And, and maybe that was his downfall, I don't know. But it, it was it was a tough time because it, it did make us a laughing stock. And, you know, yeah. all, you know like, like we just spoke about, you don't want to make excuses for anything, but... You, you do feel embarrassed. You're going out wearing the shirt with, and, and playing for the badge, and you, you know that your owners, you know, send his knob out. Clean pictures of his knob. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a time when you think, um, yeah, this isn't quite the professional, um, um, you know, place which I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that the minute you see his knob, is that's the moment you go, ah, not what I expected. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I've taken a few steps down here. <laughs> John, honestly, mate, we really good laugh, good to chat to you. Um, and I think your honesty has been superb. And if anyone wants to give you shit for your time at Sunderland, I think you've been fantastically honest with it. Um, yeah, I'm used to it, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, mate. But congratulations on the promotion. Best of luck with everything Thank that you, you do. Um, yes. And I really appreciate you coming on, mate. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Cheers, mate. Cheers, yeah. Thank you.